in the in the last service, I uh, I told the group that Tony. I mean, he, like he said, we become pretty close over the last couple of years, especially in the last year when we went on a trip to Bogota together. But he uh, he's one of the few brothers who I know is praying for me all the time, and um, he reaches out to me all the time, letting me know that that he's got my back in prayer, and not just vague prayers, I mean specific prayers, with verses to back him up, I mean text messages like he's a, like he's a college student texting me, like text messages this long. And um, they're so valuable to me, I ch cherish that, and it provokes me to prayer for him, and uh, I love him, I love your pastor, and, uh, and I, I pray you recognize what you have in him as a leader, as a visionary. Um, I occasionally get the benefit of hearing his heart for you, and uh, it's amazing. It's amazing what he is uh, to his flock, and, and so keep him in your prayers and continue to follow him as he follows the Lord. Um, you know, the lady, there was an older lady in the last service who came up to me after the service and said, I can tell that you and, and Tony are good friends. And I was like, really? How, how's that? She's like, you're both very loud. <laughs> like, okay, I'll take it. So uh, she meant it sweetly, but so maybe I fit right in. Yeah? Okay. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 14 today, okay, with a story that is probably pretty familiar. Um... So I, I, I pray you bear with me here, okay? This is probably a story that you've read many times. This is a story that's in all of the children's Bibles. It never gets left out, okay? So you might be aware of it. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell this, this story in two parts. And um, we're going to look at, at what God uh, will have for us this morning. The message is called Faith for Storms, okay? That's a pretty stereotypical message title, too. I wish it was more clever. But that's what this message is about, Okay, faith for storms. And we're going to look at what's required of a believer um, in, terms of, in terms of facing life's trials. What's demanded of us. Okay, so, so Jesus, just to give you the backdrop here, Jesus has been traveling. Okay, he's been traveling with his disciples and he's just left his hometown of Nazareth uh, where he was rejected. I don't know if you're familiar with that uh, story, but Jesus goes with his disciples and he goes and tries to make himself known in the temple where he grew up and, and, uh, and, and to, in the synagogue there where he grew up. And he goes and meets some people, meets some, some people that he grew up with, and they reject him. And they, they say, hey, this is just the, the son of Joseph. This is just another carpenter. He's no prophet to us. And he, they rejected him outright. And so he leaves. And uh, he starts to head off to, to find a place of solace, a place of rest. And if you know anything about Jesus and the disciples, they seem like they're always trying to find a place for rest and they can never find it. Right? They, they can't ever get the rest they're looking for. And I think there's a good lesson in that uh, for all of us who call ourselves Christians, followers of Jesus Christ. If you're going to follow Jesus, um, you might always be looking for a moment of rest, a, a place of comfort. Uh, but they're going to come few and far between. Uh, we're called to a work and it stretches us thin sometimes. It's burdensome. Uh, but Jesus Christ makes that burden light. And so they, they leave uh, Nazareth and then they start traveling. And this is where we pick up in verse 13 of Matthew 14. Are you guys ready and with me today? And by the way, if you're a note taker, um, there'll be key points. And the main thing you need to get today is the key points and the verse references. And you'll have the whole message written down and, and you'll be totally fine. Okay? So Matthew chapter 14 verse 13 says, When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion towards them. And so his followers began to increase, right? So he's going from, from 12 men to, to 100 and, and here soon thousands. And he, he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place, and time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give, give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. And he said, Bring them hither to me. 
And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they, lo- they took up uh, of the fragments the rem- uh, that remained twelve baskets full. And they, had eaten, they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. Okay, so what's happening? All right, so the people are hungry. There's lots of them, right? And what Jesus says is, well, we need to feed them. And the disciples are like, nah, they got to go. They got to go somewhere else. And Jesus is moved with compassion. He says, no, we're going to feed them. What do we have? And they said, we got five loaves and two fishes. And so Jesus takes the, 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 the fish and he takes the bread and he blesses it and then distributes it to his disciples. And the disciples then distribute it to the people. And God works a crazy miracle here. God works a crazy miracle. And the question is, just, I'm going to call you to imagine yourself there. Imagine yourself as one of the disciples. Imagine you, God used you to hand out and distribute those loaves and those fishes. What kind of faith would that produce in you? What would that do to your heart? What would that do in terms of your willingness to surrender to this man, Jesus? God just used you to participate in one of the greatest miracles ever. And I think the thing that we often forget in 2018 is that this is actually the God that we worship. We like to isolate and we like to compartmentalize and we often think about this amazing story and this amazing moment in an amazing time where Jesus was here on earth and we somehow got left with the leftovers. As though God's eyes aren't on us. As though He's not a miracle worker on our behalf. As though He's not our provisional God. This is the God of multiplication. This is the God that we worship. The the, the same God that turned five loaves and two fishes into thousands of meals is the same God that is establishing a gospel work here in Iola, Kansas. And you have to believe that. You have to believe that God wants to do way more than provide food for Iola. You've got to believe that God wants to multiply souls in this place, which is a far greater work. It's far more miraculous. It's far more amazing. God taking a single soul and using that soul to multiply itself in investment into other people. That's way more amazing and way more miraculous than the loaves and the fishes. And that's what God wants to do here, and He wants to use you to do it. But yet so often we forget. The twelve disciples of Christ's inner circle have just experienced the creative and provisional hand of an almighty God, which should stoke the fire of their faith. You know, when we, when we started uh, Midtown Baptist Simple, some of you I know have never been, some of you have been down maybe for Mission Focus, but that's the church that I, that I pastor at. And when we first uh, left Kansas City Baptist Temple to go plant the church in Midtown, um, we, left, we left with about 45 people, right? Young people, young families. And we went down into Westport. I don't know if you're familiar with the city, but Westport's like the Midtown area. And we um, started doing Bible studies on Sunday nights. And it was a very modest and meager work, all right? Uh, the... The, the facility, the area that we were meeting in was gross and disgusting, um, smelled like mildew. I mean, I can, tell you, I can tell you story after story about what it was like being on that corner in the city during that time. It was rough. And uh, we came down there with 45 people, and, and a, a month or so later, we looked around, and there was only 25 of us left. People didn't have the stomach for it. They didn't have stomach for all the homeless people that were sleeping on the doorstep or, or the messes that were left behind that we had to clean up before we could even start services. I can't even tell you some of the things that I found, you know, drug paraphernalia and things like that. And, and people just didn't, God bless them, they weren't ready for that. That's okay. But we recognized our desperation. We recognized that we worshipped a creator God. We recognize that our God was the type of God that took small things and did big things with them. 
And so we began to pray, and we asked the Lord, look, God, would you help us? We have no power or ability in and of ourselves. We're desperate for you. We know that you want to use a small people to do a great work. You, we know that you want to see people saved and discipled and following after you. Would you use us to do this? And we prayed and we prayed. And you know, I, again, fast forward, it's unfair to not tell you all the stories, but 10 years later, we sit a church of 600 people. This is the type of God that we serve. This is the type of God who wants to do a great work in Iola. There's not a single person in these neighborhoods over here that God does not have a heart for. They shouldn't be sitting in these pews. They shouldn't be with you right now, signing up for COD. See, God wants to reach Iola, and He can do it. He can do it, and He wants to use you. This is the God we serve. And hasn't He already been doing it? What did things look like a year ago or two years ago? Hasn't God, God been at work in your midst? See, we have to learn to remember the times of blessing as well. We have to remember what God did. These disciples, well, God uh, uses five loaves and two fishes to feed 5,000 5, and more people. And you better believe that they needed to hold on to that fact. What they just experienced, they needed to hold on to because that faith was going to come in handy in the times of trial. And, and the question is for you, what has God done in your midst? What has He used this church to do? What has God done in your family? What has God done among your friends? How has God used you? And it's important for us to take time to acknowledge those things and memorialize those things and remember them and write them down. You know, so few Christians actually journal. Take the time to write down all that God did, how God's answered prayer. We're lazy. We're lazy. We're lazy Christians. And we struggle to give God even the most basic devotional time. But what I want to point out to you is that memorializing the miraculous prepares us for stormy trials. That's our first key point today. There will be a time when you need those memorials to restoke the fire of faith in your heart. You will need these testimonies. You will need to go back and remember all the ways that God has blessed you in your ministry, how God worked in your life, in your heart, in your family, in this church. You're going to need those times. You're going to need to rely on them because those things are going to be areas and points for future faith. So we need to memorialize the miraculous in order to prepare our hearts and our lives for the stormy trials that are absolutely coming. When difficult seasons come, you are going to need those stories of faith and blessing. Let's look at verse 22. 14-22. So after the, the, the miracle of the fishes and the loaves, God invites His disciples to go down into a ship and to set sail. Verse 22 says, And straightway Jesus constrained His disciples to get into a ship and to go before Him unto the other side, while He sent the multitudes away. So, the command here, is Jesus tells the disciples on the heels of this miracle, on the heels of their excitement, look guys, I want you to go down I want you to get into a ship down to the Sea of Galilee, get into a ship, I want you to cross the Sea of Galilee and head toward Bethsaida, which was a suburb of Capernaum. Okay, you hear my command? I want you to go. Now imagine for a moment what these young men were feeling. Okay, they had just seen this miracle take place. All right, and, and so like, uh, imagine the type of excitement that you would, you would see from a bunch of high school football players after a big win, right? How do those types of guys act? You, you, you guys are familiar how boys act when they get together? I mean, these men haven't been around their wives uh, or a, a lot of women for a while now. It's just been these 12 and Jesus. And I, guys on tour get pretty gross, don't they? Yeah? So these guys are on tour, right? And they just witness this miracle. And, and, and on the heels of that miracle, the excitement, they're pushing each other. They're talking trash. They're just so full of faith. They're beating their chest. And they're headed down to the ship just to follow Jesus' command. Right? Can you imagine that for a moment? They're full of faith. And yet Jesus is asking them to step right into a trial. He's inviting them to go and face a difficult storm. And they have no idea. They have no idea that it's coming. But He is inviting it. 
Now, here's the thing that we need to understand. Is that trials can either bolster our faith or they can rob us of our faith, can't they? And that's, what's, that's, that's the temptation here. Is that their faith would be robbed from them in this moment. Now, before we get into all that, there's something that we need to recognize as Christians. Can we take a moment right now to pause and consider what it means to be a Christian? To be a Christian... To be a Christian means that we experience many contrasting feelings and forms. Sometimes our Christianity yields elation and excitement, just like what the disciples are facing right here. But sometimes our Christian faith brings about trial and difficulty and sadness and depression. And if you don't believe that to be true, maybe you haven't been a Christian very long, just wait a little while, it's coming. But many of us, some of us Christian veterans can recognize, and can say right now, I know, I've seen those trials. I've seen those trials. I recognize them. But I'm telling you, if you're a Christian, you're going to face both very exciting times and, and very humbling, difficult trials. This is a cold, hard fact. The Christian faith is bolstered by its blessing and tested by trials. Tested by trials. With the intent that both ends of the spectrum would work out faith in us. That they would build greater faith. Paul says to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Can you imagine? Glorying in your infirmities? that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul's saying, look, it's these moments of trial and difficulty where I recognize the true power of Jesus Christ. Peter confirms that as well. He says in 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, so many of us think trials are so strange, don't we? Some of us think that, that trials are completely foreign and unnatural to the Christian life. It's like, God, why are you allowing this awful circumstance to come into my life? It's like an alien ship landed in your backyard. It's completely foreign to you. And the issue is that you have failed as a Christian to embrace the fact that our faith is both elation and excitement and difficulty. Key point number two. A defining characteristic of Christianity is the acceptance of trial. Is the acceptance of trial as fundamental and familiar to our faith. Guys, listen to me. We live in a Christian world, in a Christian America, where so many of the most famous pastors in the United States, and on every street corner, in fact, are teaching a gospel that says that you should have things your way and you should have them easy. The church and Christian life should be about pleasure and about ease. And it's a lie from the pit of hell. And we're going to get nothing done with that way of thinking. We have to embrace the fact that our Christianity is both trial and excitement. It's adventure and difficulty. It's fundamental. And listen to me. Trial should be familiar to our faith. Sorrow should be familiar to us. These are companions in our Christian walk. I mean, Paul says, I take pleasure in my infirmities. It's a familiar friend. What if we looked at things that way? What if we looked at our trials as something that, would, that was good for us and right? Very few of us do. Very few of us can even recognize what a trial looks like. We fail to even know what a trial looks like in our life. We can't spot it. We can't point it out. It may be happening to us and we don't even know. We get so confused about what a trial is. Let's define it. Let's look at three different traits of a trial. Verse 23. How do we know? How do we know a trial? Verse 23 and 24 tell us. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. So here's our setting. Christ goes up into a mountain place and begins to make intercessions. As he sends the disciples away, Christ goes get some 
goes and gets some alone time with God the Father, and he starts praying and making intercessions. He's, he's praying for us, you recognize, right? That's what that word means. He's praying for his disciples. He's interceding on our behalf. And he's up there, and he's praying, and he sends the men down. And look at verse 24. It says, But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was what? Contrary. Contrary. The ship is out on the Sea of Galilee and the water is smashing against the boat and the wind is fighting against the boat and it's, going, it's blowing contrary to the direction of the boat. So think for a moment. The disciples are obeying their master. They go down to the sea. They get into the ship. They know the direction that they're headed. They point their ship in the right direction. They're in His will and the wind is blowing contrary to the direction of the boat to the direction of the will of God. It is common for our ambitions and will to be aligned with the masters and yet for the winds of our circumstances to be contrary. Key point number three. You can always identify a trial by its opposition to God's work of faith in your life. That's how you identify a trial. Okay? We use the word trial and suffering and difficulty and all these words, we use them flippantly in the church. And it's a real shame. You know, <clears throat> my wife and I just recently, I'm about to tell you something that's going to be really revealing. My wife and I just started exercising together in the mornings to something called bikini body. <laughs> it's okay, you can laugh. You can laugh at that. It's a, it's a tr training program. It's circuit training, and it's called Bikini Body. And I am a, uh, I'm a submitted husband, and I want to support my wife, and so I'm working on my bikini body, okay? Um, and it's been rough. And there have been days where I've, I've walked away from it, okay? And I've felt, I've felt so much muscle pain, okay, that I've, I could easily, in my mind, say, oh, this is a trial that I'm in that I'm suffering. I'm suffering this, this trial. We use the word trial. We just throw it around like it's nothing. Right? A lot of us, we talk about trials. We don't even know how to identify a trial. We, we say, we're going through a trial because money is getting tight. Well, you shouldn't have three credit cards. We say, oh, well, my grades are really bad. I'm in a trial. No, you haven't studied for three months. This is some moms are laughing at their children right now. <laughs> I'm struggling to get along with other people, you know. I'm just, no, that's because you're a jerk. People don't like me. I'm in a trial. Brother, things are, things are so hard at work, you know. I just don't feel like I fit in. It's just been rough. Now you're a jerk to the people at work. Nobody likes you because you're mean. I can't seem to find a husband. That's just, just, just such a trial. And we use this word trial. We don't even understand what a trial is. But listen to me. Listen to me. If you're sober-minded, you will always recognize a trial in your life by whether or not it's perpetrating against a work of faith in your life. That's how you identify a trial. This thing is coming in contrary to God's will for me. It's a trial. It's keeping me. It's keeping me from attending church regularly. It's a trial. It's keeping me from my discipleship relationship. I know I'm supposed to be meeting. And I know we're supposed to be getting together and studying God's Word. I'm supposed to be learning. And it's a trial. It's affecting my intimacy with God, my time in His Word alone at home, and my prayer life. It's a trial. My growth, my development, the mission, the ministry, it's getting in the way of these things. That's a trial. We don't get to use the word trial any way we want. We use it the way the Bible defines it. And the Bible defines it as something that runs contrary to the will of God. You know, I can't tell you how often I've seen in ministry, the moment someone signs up for COD and they fill out the form, yes, I want to get discipled, I want to be mentored, I want to be invested, and I'm ready to move forward. And then five lessons into it, that girl calls, that old girlfriend calls. Or they get a new job offer that keeps them, that keeps them busier than they were before. And they trade, a, they trade the right thing for a good thing. And it's wicked. And it's a trial. 
It's intended to test their faith. It's intended to strengthen them so that they might move past it, not succumb to it. So we know a trait. We can identify the foe of our faith by its opposition to God's will. Next, we can identify a trait by the sense of solitude that it creates in us. The sense of solitude that it creates in us. And when he had sent the multitudes away, verse 23, he went up into a mountain apart to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. One of the primary traits of trial is that we often convince ourselves that we're alone, as though no one can understand our problems, as though no one is there for us in our trial. Jesus is on a mountaintop, and they're down in the basin. They're out in the water. Jesus is far away. He can't help them. And they've convinced themselves of that fact. They've convinced themselves of that. And you know what? We do the same thing. What happens when trial comes into our life? So many times, when a trial enters into our life, we go into isolation. We go hiding. We don't lean into the body. We, get, we lean out. We disappear. Because we are convinced that we can fix our own difficulties when God is just simply saying, I've invited this into your life that you might find greater faith. But we, yet so often we, we hide away. We go into the darkness. And in our mind, there is no help for us. Key point number four. This is super important. When we find fear in our trial and we fear that Christ is far away, we've already failed to remember the miracles of the fishes and the loaves. We've already forgotten what God is capable of doing. When we choose fear, when we choose isolation, we are telling God, the God that has worked all those miracles in our life, that His hand is not extended to us. That He has no power and no authority in this situation. What a wicked thought. We've all done it. We have all convinced ourselves that God is, is, is too far away to be with us in the midst of our trial. As though He's not capable. Listen, faith is believing. Psalm 46.1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. A very present help in trouble. A very present help in our trouble. So let's look at trait number three. Trait number three of a trial. Jesus Christ is always nearby. He's prompt in His power. He's prompt. Verse 25, And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Here comes the miracle worker. You know, it's said that, that if the disciples were in the midst of the Sea of Galilee, they were three and a half miles away from the shoreline. Look, this may not mean anything to you, but to me it means that, that Jesus transcended a mountain and walked three and a half miles across the sea to get to them. The one that had the compassion for the hungry people is the same one that has compassion for his disciples, so much so that he transcends a mountain and walks across the sea to get to them. You know, Mark 6.48 this tells the same exact story. Mark chapter 6 tells the same exact story of, of the, the, the storm. And it says in verse 48 that Jesus saw them toiling, toiling in their rowing. He saw them from the mountaintop. Do you know that He sees you in the midst of your toil? He sees you. Key point number 5, listen. Christ's vision is vast. He sees all things. He has the, the number of hairs on your head counted. He knows every tear you've ever cried. He knows every trial that you're in. He sees you. His vision is vast. His hearing is limitless. 
His reach is endless. His feet are boundless. And His timing is impeccable. He is there for us and He is always right on time. Perhaps the most beautiful thing about Jesus is not the fact that He's divine. Uh, we like to talk about Jesus' divinity. Okay? And then the fact that, that God sent His only Son to this earth and, and the miracles. We see what Christ wrought on this earth and man, it's so powerful and we see that this is the all-powerful, all-knowing God. And you know what? The thing about Jesus that makes me so excited and so amazed isn't the fact that He's divine. It's the fact that He's divine and empathetic. That He's divine and loving. That He's divine and He knows our infirmities. It's that He's divine and all-powerful and all-knowing and He's my friend. That's what's amazing about Jesus. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Listen, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. See, the writer of Hebrews is telling us that all we need to do is look at Christ as someone who's near to us and knows us well. And that should empower us to pray to Him with faith and boldness. He loves us. And He gets it. He gets it. He understands. He sees it with your eyes. He sees it with your pain. But it's not good enough for us to just survive trials, is it? God wants us to thrive in the midst of the tempest. Look at verse 26. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. They thought Jesus was a ghost for a moment. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Now listen, listen. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me uh, come unto thee on the, on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. See, in this moment, listen to me, in this moment, Peter is not content with surviving the storm. He wants to thrive in the storm. He wants to thrive. Think about how crazy and ludicrous this is. He's out in the middle. You, just to put yourself in his shoes for a moment. The, the boat is getting tossed to and fro. Okay? He, he, he's, his choice is to come out of the water, or out of the boat, into the water, and he believes, he's convinced that he can walk across the water just like this stage. That's what he's convinced of. Now, but listen to me, though. Listen to me. He was prepared for this moment. Was he not? Had he not been prepared for this exact moment? Hadn't all the disciples been prepared for this? Was it not the master who said, look, let me bless this bread, but I want you to take it, and I want you to distribute it, and I want to use you to do the miracle. I want to use your hands. Had that not just happened? See, Peter had been trained. He had been prepared. He recognized that, oh, if Jesus is walking on the water, I'm his disciple. I can walk on the water too. What would keep me from doing just as he does? That's my master. I am his child. And so he chooses to thrive in the storm. He wasn't satisfied with surviving on the boat. He wanted to thrive in the midst of the waves. Key point number six. Thriving in the storm begins, listen, begins with calling to Christ. That's what Peter did, right? He said, he said can I come to you? Can I come to you? That's where thriving begins. It's calling out to Christ. But listen to me. It's sustained by believing Him. It's sustained by believing Him. Thriving in the storm begins with calling to Christ. And it's sustained by our believing in Him. In him. I mean, verse 30, we learn very quickly that Peter's doubt 
and fear overcame him. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. You know, the enemy of our faith is fear. Isn't it? The enemy of our faith is fear. And so here's the question for you this morning. Harvest, listen. What trial has Satan orchestrated in your life personally that is causing you to fear? What fear in your life is keeping you from thriving? Listen to me. Let's define thriving for a minute. You can be a Christian who survives. That's a Christian that's a pew sitter. They come to church every Sunday and they come and they sit down and they listen to Tony. Man, he's such a great teacher. And you beat your chest and then you go back to work and you forget all about your faith all week long until next Sunday. That right there is a surviving Christian. They've got their ticket punched, heaven bound, all good, happy, just to do my own thing. But a thriving Christian says, I am, that's not good enough for me. I will be mission minded. I will believe that God wants more for me. I will like, live like a disciple of Jesus Christ. I will be used to reach the people of this town, of this state, of this world. I will be used. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I'm believing him for the impossible. Because I'm a Christian that thrives. I believe Jesus Christ for all the crazy stuff. All the crazy stuff. That's what I believe him for, the impossible stuff. See, there's a difference. There's a difference. But fear, when fear creeps in, it convinces us that those things are impossible. That those things are impossible. Look at verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand. Of course he did. The compassionate Jesus Christ, of course he stretched forth his hand to save Peter. He didn't transcend that mountain and come across the Sea of Galilee for no reason, just to let them die, to let Peter dr drown. Master, help me. He reaches out. He grabs him. And listen to what he says. And said unto him, O thou of little faith, Wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. So what is the lesson here? What's the lesson here? I want to I take a moment to do something. This, I promise you this is not blasphemous. But I want you to reimagine Scripture here for a moment. I want you to imagine if the story transpired a little bit differently. Like, what would have made for a better story? What would have made for a better story? I believe a better story would have been, the storm came, Jesus transcends the mountain. He walks out onto the Sea of Galilee. And all 12 of the disciples say, Jesus, let us come to you. And they all climb out of the boat. And they all walk to Jesus. And their faith doesn't waver. And fear doesn't creep in. And Jesus and the twelve walk across the Sea of Galilee together to Bethsaida. That's a better story. Now I want you for a moment to reimagine what faith looks like in this church. If people weren't doubting. If there weren't pew-sitting Christians. If there weren't people who were just comfortable having their, their heaven ticket punched. What if the believers in this congregation chose to believe, and not just the survive, for the surviving, not just for mercy, but they relied on the grace of Jesus Christ day by day to be used in this community? I tell you right now, there isn't a building in this whole town that would hold the people that are being discipled. This entire region would be affected. The entire world would be impacted by that kind of faith. What if we were so in awe of God and His Word, His perfect Word, His perfect preserved Word? What if we were so in awe that we couldn't help but believe? We couldn't help but step out. What if we lived in the night as though it was daytime? In darkness, as though it was light. What if our faith actually, actually sustained us? What could we be used to do? Who could we be used to help? If our faith was great, how great would our ministry be?
You know, the disciples actually address this issue. In Mark chapter 6, in the same exact story, the disciples reflect on why they didn't step out of the boat. We get some insight into this story. Mark chapter 6, verse 51. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. Wait, wait, wait. They weren't sore amazed because of what Christ did. They're sore amazed at themselves, and they wondered, and they contemplated, and they considered. Look, listen, look, look at verse 52. They considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their hearts were hardened. The reason that they didn't have faith to step out in the boat, the, 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 the reason that they weren't thriving in ministry, the, the reason that they weren't full of grace and power was because they had forgotten what Christ had done in their lives in the past. And so that leaves us with a question. Are you relying on the memorials of what Christ has done or are you forgetting? Are you taking time to consider, well, Christ did this in my life, so of course He can take that mountain. Of, of course He can take this trial. Of course He can handle this difficult situation. Of course He can. And I'm going to move forward in faith. I believe. I believe because I've seen all the things that He's done. And He's good to me. And He's compassionate. And He's all-powerful. And He's my friend. And I will come out to Him on the water. The Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for this time. And Lord, I just ask that You would show us what it means to remember You. To remember all that You are. Lord, to, to, to learn what it means to live a life of, of thriving in faith, in surrender, in yielding. Lord, this world has nothing on You. And Lord, so quickly we align our philosophy and our way of thinking to what we see in this world and we think materialistically and we think temporally and we forget the, the, the eternal nature that you've put inside of us. And we, we get bound up and we get put into to bondage and we're not liberated to live in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a grace li lifestyle. Lord, teach us what it means to thrive in the midst of the storm, believing you, full of faith, surrendered, trusting you, because you are good, you are powerful, and you are my friend. In Jesus' name, amen.